This podcast is a member of the Place to Be Nation family. Visit us at placetobenation.com, the only place to be in your pop culture world. This is It Was a Thing on TV. Spoiler number one is Dr. Lee Franz. It stinks. What is going on? <laughs> what is going on? Episode 95, submission number 761, Kid Nation. Kid Nation aired on CBS from September 19th to December 12th, 2007, for a total of 13 episodes. This is Bonanza City, New Mexico, or what's left of it anyway. The pioneers who ran this place back in the 1800s ran it into the ground. Lack of leadership and lack of will combined to leave this town completely and totally dead. But that's about to change. Now, 40 new pioneers will try to fix their forefathers' mistakes and build a town that works. It won't be easy. Pioneer living is tough. And the amazing part is, these pioneers are children. That's right, the oldest just turned 15. The youngest is eight and a half. They are every kind of kid imaginable. City kids, country kids, rich, poor, and everything in between. And they're on their way here right now. I'm not gonna be with my parents. There's no adults, and I think I'm gonna die out here because there's nothing. It's kinda hard to believe that I'm gonna be living out here. With my sister Olivia. Here's what I'm afraid about. If I catch a bad disease or I break a leg, literally. 40 kids with no parents, no teachers anywhere. And their leaders? They're kids too. It's the first ever Kid Nation. Now, guys, we've seen a lot of reality television in the last 20 years. I've seen more than my fair share, I'll tell you that much. Yeah, and we've had your survivors, your big brothers, your amazing races over the years on CBS. But there was one show that came in the late 2000s that just came and went, and this was Kid Nation. Kid Nation. Sounds like it's a nation, right? It's a nation, right? It's a nation of kids. Of kids, yeah? Yeah, can you, can, it answers the question. What would happen if you let a bunch of kids out in an abandoned town and they did whatever the hell they wanted? Sounds like a recipe for disaster, if you ask me. Yeah. This can't end well. This no. will not end well. No. No, it would not end well. But I'm getting to but we're getting ahead of ourselves. The premise of this show, forty kids aged eight to fifteen. They've all packed up their worldly goods, well, whatever they can fit in a backpack or something, and moved to a a ghost town in New Mexico called Bonanza City. Actually, it's it's a fictional ghost town in New Mexico called Bonanza City. It was actually filmed on the Bonanza Creek Movie Ranch, which was, you know, adjacent to Bonanza City. Yeah, Bonanza City is an actual real-life ghost town. It's located 13 miles southwest of Santa Fe in New Mexico. According to Wikipedia, the town was founded in 1880 as a mining town, following the discovery of gold and silver in the nearby... I, I can't, can't even pronounce this word. Sirios Hills... I think I was going to say Chelios Hills, but no. That let me let me take a look at that. Like Chris, like Chris Chelios, but I'm like no, Chris Chelios is bubbling. Sarios, Sarios, Sarios. Okay, okay. 
be much now, more funny if it was Chris Chelios Hills, to be yeah. honest. That's it's staying a, in. That's no. That's that's an outtake. You know, this has been this has been Greg learns how to roll his R's. The, the Chris Chelios Hills. It was later abandoned sometime in the early 1900s. Later in the 20th century, the Bonanza Creek Movie Ranch, which contains a movie set depicting the mining town, was built near the ruins of Bonanza City. And, of course, Kid Nation filmed there. Okay, so we have all these kids descending upon this ghost town. All the grunt work, it seems, has been done for them. Here's a town. Go nuts. Do what you have to Make your own civilization, do your own thing, and we'll see what the result is. Yeah. This is laissez faire with preteens. What can possibly go wrong? Everything. Well, yeah, kinda. <laughs> well, okay, so yes, you are, and let's, you know what? Let's get the cave babe out of the way here. Yes, they are settling on this town. They're doing their own thing. They're creating their own system of government and their own system of society. But they didn't do it for free. No. No, who does? No, they got 5000 bucks, And gold stars were valued at 20000 and 50000 for anyone who has decided... But anyone who was the uh, the best or the most the most uh, important the best the most what am I looking for here? Yeah, the, the the most important in keeping the society active, successful, upright. Yeah, the MVP essentially. Let's just break it down to that. Oh yeah. Yeah, you're looking for, excuse me when I say this, you're looking for the Shane Bieber or the Luke Voigt of Kid Nation each week. I thought you were gonna look for I thought you were gonna say you're looking for the LeBron James of Kid Nation. No, because Giannis won the MVP again this year. Giannis did win the MVP this year. No, and I'm I'm pimping Shane Bieber because he obviously pitches for my team and he's like eight and one. But also, I got to give props to Luke Voigt because he's got 20 homers this, so far this year as nice. of recording. Uh, uh, no, guys, the real answer is the gold star winner is the Jacob deGrom of Kid Nation. <laughs> Former Las Vegas 51 in the house. I, I'm just waiting for Chico to throw out a, a, a former Charlotte player. Glenn uh, Rice. Glenn Rice, Kemba Walker. No, I was, th- I was talking Charlotte baseball, but yeah, okay. Oh, uh, whatever. Rex Chapman, hey, he's an internet star. Muggsy Bogues. Who doesn't like Muggsy Bogues? There Everybody you go. loves hey, Muggsy Bogues. Hey, speaking of Charlotte Hornets, in a couple, <laughs> who knows, soon we might have future installment. Larry Johnson as Grandmama! That's go. That's in. That's going in. Mike is like, no. He's shaking his head. Continue. So, well, well, what's there to say except that's the premise of the show? And what I don't. How long? How long was it supposed to last? It was thirteen weeks, wasn't it? Well, yeah, but, but wasn't it supposed to last beyond thirteen weeks? Well, it was it was thirteen weeks an episode, but in accelerated time, it was like forty days. Okay, it makes sense because you have forty kids, forty days. Forty kids, forty days. Yeah. So forty days, and what do we learn? Well, I don't know what we learn. Greg, help us out. Help a brother out here. Well, we learned that when you put a bunch of kids on television and they're left all on their own with no, with no parents around some crazy shit's gonna happen we're gonna go over all the crazy shit now aren't we yeah episode one I'm trying to be a leader here 40 kids across America arrive at Bonanza City for 40 days and are immediately struck by the lack of comforts in their new home 
Friendships emerge and teamwork ensues. Issues arise as the first town council convenes. The first gold store worth twenty thousand dollars, equivalent to twenty five thousand in twenty nineteen, thanks Wikipedia, is awarded on the series premiere. Showdown. The districts had one hour to fill three large bottles with their own district colored water by carrying oil gushers to certain spouts on the ground. All four teams competed in the task in the allotted time. The town council chose seven more outhouses over an old-fashioned television. Now, wait a second. What's that, would, that would actually be... an old-fashioned television. I'm stuck in one. This is the times where we wish that this was a video podcast because Mike is actually stuck in an old-fashioned television. But, yeah, that is very rare for kids like that to make a responsible decision. It's like, okay, yes, we can be entertained on the television, but at the same time, we all have to go to the bathroom sometime. Yeah. Yeah, e- even an outhouse, I'd take that over. Well, I don't even know if there's any place to, to go use the facilities out there. I mean, there, there's no leaves, so you can't wipe. Excuse the the, 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 the conversation, but... Uh, yeah, the, the outhouses are definitely uh, a lot more important than uh, than the TV. Good job, kids. The gold star was awarded to Sophia as the town council recognized Sophia's work ethic in the kitchen. It was a fairly easy decision for the council, despite Sophia voicing complaints over what she saw as problems in the kitchen. And it, as far as exits go, Jimmy being the youngest contestant, Jimmy was homesick and decided to leave Bonanza City even though Cody, Lowell, and Campbell tried to convince him to stay. His decision came after three days of debate over his abilities versus what was expected of him. Well, that sucks. It's tough being away from home, especially when you're the youngest contestant, who's, I'm going to guess, probably about eight years old or so. Being away from your parents is is very difficult. So I, I totally get it. Yeah. Episode two. To kill or not to kill, Bonanza City deals with its first crisis as temperatures plunge and the water supply freezes. Oh, no. As the town debates whether or not to kill chickens for protein, a group of kids protests by locking the chickens and themselves in the coop, but they kill two chickens. Oh, PETA's going to have their heads. Well, judging by the ratings, I'm sure they just didn't care. They weren't watching. The town council finds themselves in a tense stalemate as they debate between two possible recipients for the gold star. The kids had to build a pipeline between an active water pump and a water wheel with various obstacles put in their way. The green team was the only team that didn't finish within the one hour time limit. And the reward, which was either a giant water slide or conveniently placed water pumps designed not to freeze, was not awarded. Oh, that's painful. Yep. The water supply freezes, and one team couldn't get it done within the appropriate time limits, so they don't get a water pump, which won't freeze. What did they get, Willy Wonka? You get nothing! You lose! Good day, sir! Well, Michael would be the gold star winner in episode two because he won it because of his caring behavior towards others and generous spirit. Michael was chosen over the other leading contender, Greg, who Mike suspected was motivated only by the prize money and not by any viable qualities or contributions to the town. Yeah, this Greg guy, he's a disgrace of my own name. He's like the villain of the whole series. All that's missing is the Chico. Yeah. There were no exits in episode two. Emily considered leaving after the town killed the chickens and because she felt homesick and an outsider. But she decided to stick it out because she wants to be a quote-unquote tough cowgirl. Well, good for her. Episode three, deal with it. See, deal with it. And considering this is not a video podcast, I'm wearing the deal with it shades on my video filter on Zoom. What do you think, Mike? Uh, we've talked about my video filter. We've talked about your video filter. We just need Chico to come back and tell everybody about his background. 
But yeah, the, Greg's got the the deal with it. I don't give two you know what's about anything. Mm. Uh, gl- sunglasses on, and uh, it's quite a look. It is. Uh, I wish this was a video podcast, folks, so you could see this. Okay. In deal with it, prosperity leads to trouble when the kids spend their newly earned buffalo nickels on sweets and party the night away. Oh, my God. Do you remember the days when you, you spent your buffalo nickels on sweets? This is like the preteen version of, of Studio 54. They, they earned buffalo nickels on sweets and partied the night away. What is this, 1920? Are they flappers? Are the kids going to be snorting like... Like uh, pixie, pixie sticks. sticks, pixie sticks. Yes. Oh, that's that's horrible. Kids don't do that. Please don't. No, you don't want. But, but that. also at the same point, did they use real buffalo nickels? I wonder because well, buffalo nickels w- would be o- over a hundred years old at that point, or well, actually the newest ones would have been probably about eighty-five years old. Uh, and they'd actually have legitimate value unless they're, you know, really worn down. They're not like, you know, well, mint alleg- or near mint. Well, allegedly they wanted to build the gold stores out of like actual gold. So it wouldn't surprise me if they had actual buffalo nickels on this show. Well, even if they did have actual buffalo nickels on the show, what do you want to bet that they were actually, you know, props? Oh, I'm sure there are props, but... Uh... Like, yeah, yeah, they didn't spend that much on this show. All right. Well, the council, well, they decide to institute some law and order when they decide to set up a town curfew to curb the kids partying. So the districts had five minutes to find three ace cards attached to certain sheep in a corral. And all four teams completed the task within that time frame. The town council chose a microwave with a barrel of cocoa over 40 hot pizzas, leading to anger from the residents who wanted pizza. However, it was later accepted that having a microwave was better than pizzas. Now, hold up. Hold up, guys. I have an issue with this. I have an issue here right now. I am eating a pizza. Yeah. Imagine me eating 40 of these in a ghost town. It's not 40 per person, Chico. Come on. Okay. But it's 40 pizzas, there's 40 kids. That's one pizza. That's one that, pizza per person. And, and it's supposed and to the, last 40 days. Yeah, and the kids, you know, they're probably going to go through the pizza in like maybe two days at most. I don't know. I, I the, the pizza sounds tempting, but, you know, what could they do with the microwave? I mean, do they have microwavable food in this ghost town slash newly you know created quote unquote nation yeah there's no there's no supermarket in bonanza city what the hell are they gonna do well they got the cocoa and and they got the the water albeit it's you know ice water because it froze so i'm I'm guessing you know they could make hot cocoa to stay warm that that would be the the logical guess in my opinion yeah what else uh what else you got well, the gold store was won by Mowry. Uh, she won it for overall contributions to Bonanza City for her hard work as a merchant and her constant optimistic attitude, which was praised by the town council, who also chose to give the star to Mowry for her birthday. Aww. 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 Laurel, in particular, felt that the contributions from the town's younger kids had been overshadowed during the first seven days, and giving the gold star to Mowry was a way to rectify this. Mowry won out over contenders Morgan and Greg, who Taylor campaigned hard for. Now, once again, guys, no exits in this episode. Both Cody and Mowry had expressed homesickness and wanted to go home, but both decided to stay as Cody didn't want to leave his friends, and Mowry had Olivia to stick up to her. And Mallory just got a gold star and twenty thousand dollars, so you know what? You can all suck it at that point. Damn right. Episode four. Bless us and keep us safe. Religious and political strife comes to Bonanza City when the council dictates that all the kids attend a religious group service. When oh, boy. No, oh no, this is this is this not isn't gonna, gonna end well. No. 
When no one apart from the council leaders turns up to the service, the council leaders are left disappointed as kids of different faiths bicker with each other. It seems as though the town might fracture until Morgan unites the arguing groups by holding a relaxed town bonfire where kids of different faiths bond together in common prayer. That is called a teachable moment. Yes. So the showdown in this episode, the pioneers had 30 minutes to build a puzzle in the shape of a steeple onto a frame using squared off pieces. And then they decided to crank the puzzle to lift it upright. When all four teams finished in time, the town council decided to let the rest of the town vote on the reward as they were worried that the town would be upset with the council's decision. So the town chose a collection of holy books over a nine hole miniature golf course. Obvious joke coming. Holy moly, what a good decision. Yeah. So the gold star in this episode was won by Morgan, who won it over Greg and Zach for a friendliness and her successful no pressure establishment of a prayer time. Zach's nomination was rejected by a jealous Taylor as Zach received praise for his hard work. Greg also had his nomination dismissed by Mike, who still did not believe Greg had become a positive presence in the town. Now, we have an exit in this episode. Aww. Cody, sad and homesick, missed his loved ones, including his girlfriend, Ashley, in Ohio, and decided to leave. His friends, especially Campbell, were very upset following his departure. But, I mean, come on, he's going home back, back home to his girlfriend. Yeah, you can't blame him. I would have done it, too. Mm-hmm. I, I'd be leaving if I didn't get those pizzas. <laughs> or the <laughs> gold star. <laughs> Episode 5, Viva la Revolution. It's time for Bonanza City to hold its first town council elections. Mike and Taylor struggle with the political process as eager kids vie for their council seats. When political mudslinging gets real dirty, as Mark L. rips Taylor's campaign posters in half, young Leela winds up in tears, and it's Greg that comforts her. Aw, see, Greg does have a heart after all. All Gregs have hearts. Well, not everyone. The kids had 30 minutes to find seven pictures of U.S. presidents and put them in chronological order. One at a time, they would race into a field of piñatas and break one open to see if there was a picture inside it. If they found one, they would race back to give it to the council leader. If not, another person in the district would repeat the process. After seven pictures were found and put in order, the council leaders had to run up to a bell and ring it. The green team finished a split second before the yellow team, but they had their pictures in the wrong order. This allowed the yellow team to become the upper class for the second time. Laurel's green team managed to come in second for the first time. As a reward, the town council chose toothbrushes, toothpaste, mouthwash, and floss over a party that would have included ribs, chicken, hamburgers, and hot dogs. While many of the kids were upset with this choice, the council realized the toothbrushes were something they all needed, especially the kids with braces. Remember, these guys are preteens, which means orthotics are a thing. And food getting caught in said orthotics, even more a thing. Oh, yes, they are, yes. No, I wouldn't know from first-hand experience, because I've never had orthotics. I have, and they're right on. You need to keep those... Orthodontics, sorry. Yeah, orthodontics. Uh, Yeah, you're exactly right there. you got to keep those braces clean. You got to make sure you get the gaps in your teeth because uh, if you get any food in there, that's going to give you stinky breath. You are absolutely right. You got to make sure your teeth are are nice and clean, and you have somewhat fresh breath. And uh, yeah, uh, and, and this is not a message from from my uncle, the dentist. It's, it's from me, Mike Klaus, educator and former brace wearer. So Greg won the gold store for being a hard worker around Bonanza City, changing his typically negative attitude and being a positive influence on the younger members. Taylor described him as an older brother to the little kids. So the elections. On day 16, Bonanza City held their first town council elections. Each district had an opportunity to choose one member to run against their existing council leader. Everyone was allowed to vote only for their own district. 
or one unopposed for the Green District. Even though many on the Green team have great leadership skills, no one was unhappy with the way she had been running the district. And she was somewhat surprised when she found out no one would be running against her. Now in the Brew District, NJ defeated Olivia seven votes to three, earning her, only her own vote, a vote from her sister Mowry, and one vote from Gianna, another district member. In the Red District, Guylon defeated Mike 9-1. to one. Mike lost in a landslide defeat. He was the only one who voted for himself. At first, while the votes were being read, everyone was laughing in shock disbelief. But then after he picked himself up and stepped down, the whole district tried to comfort him. Oh. In the Yellow District, Zach defeated Taylor 5-4. to four. As there are five girls in the Yellow District, Taylor was confident that she had all their votes. But gaps, guys. It turned out Zach was able to persuade Randy to vote for him by suggesting that it might be best for everyone if someone else had a turn at being council leader. In addition, Markel takes down Taylor's campaign posters to sabotage the district's efforts to keep Taylor in office. Swing oh, my gosh. Coming soon to a theater near you. Oh, my gosh. This is fierce. This is crazy. This is, this is cutthroat. Wait, Chico, you said Swing Vote coming to a theater near you? Swing Vote 2, coming to a theater near you. Yeah, I was going to say, where's Kevin Costner for this? <laughs> Kevin Costner, she's 12, and he's, she's 12, and she's a girl. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I got to give props to Greg in this episode for getting the gold star. It looks like he was on the cusp of getting the gold star two or three times previous. So good on him for finally getting it. Yeah, that was like he finally won the big one. It was kind of like Peyton Manning in the in the Super Bowl Forty One. Okay, episode six. Bonanza is disgusting. I I don't know about you guys, but Bonanza is a great show. I don't know why people would find it disgusting. Oh wait, that's something else. Yeah, that's Bonanza, which is the original. Which is uh, yeah. Never mind. I completely butchered that transition. While the new town council struggles to find a solution for Bonanza City's growing trash problem, uh, it always comes back to the trash. They also have to deal with Taylor now that she's been voted out of power. DK continues to work hard to build a kid nation, but he's growing tired of all the petty squabbling and is seriously considering going home. Now, in the showdown in this episode, the kids had 15 minutes to locate colored in cans representative of their district in a large enclosure filled ankle high with 1,600 gallons of beans as to hide the cans from direct view and with 30 pigs wallowing in the enclosure. Only one kid from each district was allowed in at a time, and they couldn't return until they found a can. The team that found the most cans in 15 minutes was awarded the upper class and so forth, for the other job classes. If all four districts accumulated at least 75 cans, they would be rewarded with either a choice of all the fresh fruits and vegetables they could eat, or two dune buggies and an unlimited supply of gasoline to operate them. The goal was met, and the council selected the fruits and vegetables for the town, given that their diets had consisted mostly of bland starches and canned goods. I don't know about you guys, but I would take the dune buggies. I'm now, just... hold on. This is where we're going to disagree. I think the fruits and vegetables are, are the perfect uh, thing to take here. Because, A, where are they going to go with just two dune buggies in Bonanza City? But they, but they, have, yeah, unlimited, they, probably. But they have unlimited gasoline. Are well, they going to drive to a real show? What are they going to do? <laughs> but, uh, but, but also, again, uh, I think this also sort of maybe answers – the question we had regarding the microwave, well, if they had canned goods, they could microwave them, if, I'm assuming, if they have soups or stews or, I mean, even if they have, like, canned corn or, or, or green beans or something, they could at least microwave them to, to heat them up. But also, speaking of beans, I love it. 1,600 gallons of beans and 30 pigs. Pork and beans. Hey, beans are the musical fruit. Would you like to take a survey? Do you like beans? Do you like George Wen? You know what, guys? I would love to see a movie with George Wen eating beans. 
Maybe George Wendt should have been on the set of Kid Nation. Wouldn't have been awesome. Kids wouldn't have understood why or who he was, but hey, we'd get a laugh out of it. <laughs> okay. Yep. Well, the gold star in this episode went to DK. DK was shown to be hard working around Bonanza and had always helped to break up and manage altercations between the other kids, and the choice was unanimous among the four council members. Well, that's good. No exits in this episode. Taylor wanted to leave due to the pressure the council was giving her, while DK initially accepted the offer to leave, citing stress from the emotional environment around town. Guyland, both out of friendship and concerned that DK would miss out on the gold star, was able to talk to DK, encouraged him to stay. I hope he got a little cut of that gold star cash. Oh, yeah. Thank you for encouraging me to stay. Here's a couple grand. Episode 7, The Root of All Evil. Sadly, this does not have a cameo from Lewis Black. Because remember when he had a show called Lewis Black, The Root of All Evil? I remember. Yeah. I remember. I remember. Life is hard in Bonanza City, but a handful of candy or root beer in the saloon is sure to brighten a young pioneer's day. But Buffalo Nickels are scarce to come by. Yeah, because they're freaking rare. And the kids are forced to come up with creative ways to earn a little cash, leading to a conflict as they compete for customers. When the council members discover treasure while exploring a nearby mine, will the unexpected windfall create a divide between the haves and have-nots? You won't believe what happens. Spoiler alert, it totally does. Showdown. The districts were to launch golden eggs using a large slingshot to be caught on the opposite side of a partition in the middle of a field. Each team attempting to catch as many eggs as possible in 15 minutes. Each district was assigned two members to a large cushion to catch the eggs, a third member to carry the caught eggs to a chest, and the district's council member set on the partition was to guide the catchers to the location of the egg. The remaining district members rotated as egg launchers using the slingshot. The job classifications were based on the number of eggs caught by each district. Additionally, if the combined total of caught eggs exceeded 48, the town would receive a choice between either electric washers and dryers that cost 20 cents per load or hand-operated washers that were free to use as well as a single change of clothes for each child. The Blue District almost single-handedly achieved the goal, collecting 38 eggs, which was more than twice as many eggs as the second-place yellow team caught. The council decided on the hand-operated washer and additional clothes. Okay, that's a rational decision. Choosing the extra clothes, but taking hand-operated washers, which are free at the same time. But also, 20 cents per load? I'm surprised a washer and dryer would take buffalo nickels. <laughs> it must be retrofitted or something. Yeah. Maybe. So Nathan was the gold star winner in this episode, as he was considered a dedicated worker and had been told by several of the council members to stop working so hard and to relax. Greg, with whom Nathan was seen as having a hostile relationship, gave him a boost toward the gold star by recommending him for the award to the town council. There are no exits in this episode, although Nathan remarked, for half a second, I considered to leave him. He decided not to. Because you got the gold star, and if you left, you wouldn't get the 20 grand, kiddo. Yeah. Oh, episode eight. This is a great episode. Starved for entertainment. The all-work and no-play pioneer lifestyle is making the town a groomy price as Bonanza's inhabitants become ever more starved for entertainment. Though it's increasingly turned towards home, the town council hatches a plan to blight Brighton spirits. A town talent show giving the pioneers the chance to show off their talents in front of their peers. Now, guys, I got to talk sell, sell about one part in this episode that made me so happy. Now, we have not talked about Jared yet on Kid Nation. Jared is like the star of this show. Would you agree, Chico, that Jared is the Jared star? is Jared is the star of the show. Jared is basically the Zach Morris. If uh, we had the whole Zach Morris is trash sort of deal, Jared is trash. Oh, but you know what? The best part of this episode is 
Jarrett does a performance of Shakespeare in this episode. How does that go over in front of the kids? Oh, they love it! They absolutely love it! He brings down the house with his performance of Shakespeare. Because he's Jared! Okay, then. All right. Yep. Yeah, it's amazing. I gotta give credit for an 11-year-old. He really he really managed to commit to the, the whole Shakespeare thing. Good for you. Yeah. Good for you, Jared. So the showdown this episode, the kids were given an hour to chew numerous pieces of gum dispensed from nearby gumball machines. What? They're like, oh, what, what? The gum's probably like 80 years old. But it only costs a buffalo nickel. That's true. Finished pieces were given to the council leaders who were to stick to the colored gum on the appropriately marked areas of a large picture. The green team came in first place for the first time ever as they got off the snide. However, the yellow team could not complete their picture in the required amount of time. So the town was not given a reward that would have included a choice of either buckets of colored paint that could be used to liven up the dreary colors of Bonanza City or a citywide block party for the general entertainment of the town. I don't think Bonanza City would look good with a new uh, okay. coat of paint. Question, question. Would you, tr- would you trust a 12-year-old to paint a ghost town? No! Exactly. But that too. It, it would not look like painting the town in pretty colors. No, it would not make it better. It's still a town in the Old West. Yeah, it's maybe if you give it like a, some white paint or a neutral tone, but you can't like paint it red or green or, or some other color. No. That just won't work in a, a ghost town. No. So Kennedy won the gold star in this episode. Kennedy was shown as a person who both worked hard and interacted well with the other members of the town. Her successful performance in the talent show, outgoing personality, and her cordial relationships with others convinced many that she deserved recognition for her contributions to Bonanza City. Kennedy was also largely credited with convincing Savannah to stay. No exits in this episode, although Savannah considered leaving after claiming she was homesick. She was persuaded to stay after Kennedy performed her rapping slash dancing act during the talent show, and the town members expressed their desire for her to continue. Well, good on you, Kennedy. That's a good citizen. Episode 9, Not Even Close to Fair, with fair spelled F-A-I-R. I'm guessing there's a fair involved. I guess. Resentment over the apparent inequality in the strength of each district is brewing, as the Green District suggests it should be renamed the Gold District after earning half the gold stars. Guyland learns the hard lesson of thinking before speaking when he says his district is in need of intellectuals, making his infuriated district feel dumb. After the town prize isn't won at the showdown, Guyland accuses the other districts of being selfish, infuriating Sophia Gregg and many others. A shocking announcement at the town hall meeting threatens explosive fireworks among several of the kids. Okay, stuff just got real. First off, they want to be called the Gold District? Excuse me, Green District. Why do I feel like all of them should have the deal with it sunglasses on like Greg's filter on on Zoom? Deal with it. We got half the stars. Ha, ha, ha. But then Guylin, man, think before you speak, kiddo, you know, saying you need intellectuals in the district. Duh, you're telling your constituents they're idiots, which makes you an idiot because that's a dumb move. Yeah. Yeah, just a little bit, yeah. Yeah, th- th- this almost sounds like the beginning of the end, not necessarily in terms of the show, but in terms of basically the civilization, the kid nation. Yeah, because one district is coming across as, hey, we're better than you, and we should be like a superior status. We should be gold district. And then another person, uh, the, one of the other three districts, is calling out his constituents, his his fellow district mates, 
for being stupid, essentially. So we have district reassignments in this episode. Due to the journal's suggestion this week, some of the districts decided to mix up their members. Blaine was moved from blue to yellow because Zach wanted some quote-unquote manpower on his team. And Anj wanted to separate Greg and Blaine because quote-unquote bad things happen when they are together. Emily was traded to the blue team for Nathan because Guylan wanted someone who is smart and works hard. And Anj wanted to prove that he has some leadership skills by getting Emily to work harder since she started to become lazy recently. Laurel didn't want to change her district at all because she considers hers to be the closest knit group and didn't want to disturb it. Many in the town were extremely upset over the changes, especially because they were seen as unnecessary and unfair. Taken down by a reality show trope, what can you say? So the showdown in this episode, the new teams ran a rock hauling race. Racks were placed in mining carts to be hauled through an obstacle course. Teams could either carry fewer rocks and have a greater chance of gaining upper class or haul more than their share to work towards the town prize, while potentially sacrificing their individual job class. The town needed to haul one ton of rocks in order to earn the reward, but the tally came up short and they missed out on the town reward for the second time in a row. The lost reward was a choice of beds for the entire town or a kid lounge trailer. Whoa. So they're sleeping on cots, I assume? In tents? Or like, it's it's what, in a the, tents or cots, yeah. What's the deal here, Greg? I don't know. I would, I, I would I, to be honest, I would take the trailer. Just me. Just you? Just me. I, I just want to... You probably get air conditioning in that trailer, I bet. Oh, I bet you there's unlimited pixie sticks in the trailer, too. Oh, yeah. All the pixie sticks. And, and no curfew. No curfew. Uh-huh. You do whatever you want in there. Go totally Studio 54. Absolutely. Uh, Blaine was the Gold Star winner in Episode 9. In his new yellow district, he was able to shine out from under Greg's shadow. His performance helped the yellow team make it across the finish line second in the minecart race and gave them the necessary motivation and assistance to more effectively complete their jobs in Bonanza City. Now, we have an exit in this episode. Despite the comforting efforts of Taylor and Greg, Randy became homesick and ultimately decided to leave Bonanza. Her decision was reached after two nights and much ribbing by the other members of the town. Their kids, they're going to give her harsh ribbing. Yeah. So sad. Episode 10. Let me talk. The town council creates a game meant to improve communication and build respect, but gets heat from the town for being disrespectful themselves. The town council responds by threatening to give the gold star to no one. Meanwhile, Greg and Blaine spy on the Green District bashing them, and they are not pleased with what they hear. After a series of confrontations, Greg makes the town an offer. If more than half the town wants him to go home, he will pack up and leave Bonanza forever. The kids refused and wanted Greg to change. After hearing a word from Jonathan, Greg apologizes for his behavior and promises to try to change. So it's like, uh, what, what, how many times has Greg promised to change? Oh, yeah. This is what I mean by he's, he's kind of like the villain of this show. Like Greg is the villain and Jared is just trash. Well, just remember what was uh, said in the previous episode when the district reassignments occurred. Anjay said he wanted to separate Greg and Blaine because "quote unquote" bad things happen. Uh-huh. I don't think he's wrong. All right, guys, we have a showdown in this episode. The citizens of Bonanza ran a pie race. <laughs> Pies. Yeah, pies were hoisted to the top of a tower where a district member would place it on top of two pie holders held by two more district members balancing on beams. 
The pie holding members had to bounce the pie and transport it across the beams to another tower, while another district member would take it and slide down a chute to the district's council member below. The council leader then had to dig to the bottom of the pie to uncover a picture or of a mode of communication, telegraph, telephone, typewriter, etc., and put the pies in chronological order according to the invention date of the mode of communication. The town won the reward, a choice of four ponies or letters from home. Okay, what are they going to do with four ponies? Well, I, I wonder, do you think, do you guys think that uh, Peter Griffin took one of the ponies to give to Nick when she needed it? At a certain time where she would need it? Huh. Forgive me, Chico, for saying this. Pony! Pony. Just remember, ponies do need food. Yeah. You remember that pony you wanted when you were six? Well, I bought him, and I've been saving him for a time like this. Surprise! <gasps> oh, oh, God, that's right. Ponies, p- ponies like food, don't they? Oh, boy. The town council considered the ponies because they thought if they chose the letters, kids might become very homesick and leave. After a hard decision, the council chose the letters. Despite the council's decision to deny Taylor any rewards, they gave her her letter in exchange for a promise that she would work harder in the future. I can understand why they'd be homesick, but also at the same time, this, is, uh, this episode, Let Me Talk, is happening between days 29 and 31. So that means the kids have been separated from their parents for just about a month now. I can definitely understand them wanting to hear something from home. You know, oh, your brother went to summer camp. You know, dad got a raise. Uh, We're going to have a new puppy when you get home or a new baby. Some sort of encouragement. So they made the right choice, I I believe. Well, the new town council threatened not to give out a gold star. They decided to recognize Laurel's hard work throughout the first 28 days of Bonanza's town council. No exits in this episode, although several kids intimated that they might leave. Taylor once again threatened to leave after DK and the town council brought pressure to bear on her for lack of work. Both Zach and Laurel contemplated leaving after the seemingly disastrous way in which the new town council was operating. At the town council meeting, Greg, fed up with the town's dissatisfaction, offered to leave if more than 50% of the town voted him out. So what no, he didn't leave. He got 49% of the vote. Oh, yeah. yeah, that was close. Well, I don't know whether he got 49%, yeah. but that would be kind of funny. Yeah. Okay, on day 28, Bonanza City held their second town council elections. Election rules was the same as last time, although this time the entire process from the announcement that there would be an election to the election itself took place within a single town hall meeting. An entirely new town council was elected. In the Green District, Michael defeated Laurel 6-3 to three, as Michael decided that he wanted to develop his leadership skills and decided to run against Laurel. In the Blue District, Greg defeated Anjay 7-2 to two, as Anjay was defeated after receiving only his and Alex's votes. Okay, now we got to remember two things. One, Anjay was the person who sort of started the, uh, the rearranging, the, the uh, realignment because of his comments previously about uh, the, the people in his district uh, not being that smart, but also Greg, who said, oh, if half of you want me to leave, I'll leave. Well, look at this. Seven of his own just voted for him, so he must not be as hated as he thinks he is. In the Red District, DK won unopposed, as Guylin decided not to run, asking the town council to vote him off. In the Yellow District, Blaine defeated Zach 5-4, to four, as, Bl- as Blaine promised to motivate the town more than the current town council and won by a narrow majority. Episode 11. Uh, this is a comment I would always say whenever I would go to school. I just like the recess part. Who doesn't like recess? Everybody likes recess. Oh, recess is a great show. Oh, wait, we're not talking about that. No, we're not talking about that. <laughs> The town council issues Taylor an ultimatum. Work or don't share in any of the town rewards and watch as the other kids reap the benefits. 
Taylor is still refusing to work after promising to start working harder in the last episode, as she remains adamant about not liking to be bossed around. The town council swears to withhold any reward that they may win from her, no matter what it is this time. However, Zach, her former opponent, becomes her unlikely motivator by treating her with respect. Meanwhile, the council appoints Sophia as the first town sheriff when everyone else in town starts shirking their duties also. They chose Sophia because she's responsible. Oh, yeah. Sophia's like the uh, she's like the one smart person in the, this show. Well, she is. <laughs> I can, I can I'm hear. sorry. I, I, I apologize. If anybody who was on Kid Nation hears this, I, I apologize for laughing at what Greg just said, but he's not wrong. Yeah. She's responsible. The citizens of Bonanza City in the showdown were given a literal pop twist. Each district was given time to study a pamphlet detailing the history of Bonanza City. Uh, Jonathan then asked the town questions based on... Oh yeah, I forgot to mention. We forgot to mention the guy that's hosting this show. It's some guy named Jonathan Karsh. Who? Exactly. She's he's he's like that. What what's her face from Joe Millionaire season one? Who? Exactly. Nobody cares about this guy. It's like all I know is he won the audience award and the best directors award at the twenty oh three Sundance Film Festival before Kit Nation. At least we all know who Dunkelman is. Yeah. I mean, come on. Brian Dunkelman was a better host than this guy. I don't yeah. even remember who. I, I was like, for a moment there, I didn't even think the show had a host. Yeah. And, and also, we should add, Brian Dunkelman will show up on future installment 3 South. Huh? Oh, yeah. I forgot he was on that show. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Jonathan asked the town questions based on it, and three answers were printed on balloons behind him. The districts answered by using a slingshot to pop the two balloons with the incorrect answers. The first district to answer three questions correct were the upper class. The second were the merchants and so on. The leftover ammunition from all the districts had to completely fill a jar for the town to get the reward. They were successful, and the reward was a choice between books for a library or a free video game arcade. And guys... For the first time, the council went with the fun option and chose the arcade. Taylor Taylor is initially denied entry, but is later allowed in after working harder. Proving for once and for all, kids hate books. Hey, you give uh, you give somebody a choice between books and an arcade, nine times out of ten, they're going to pick the arcade. Now, wait, I got to know. What was in the arcade? Was it old school games or was it like Dance Dance Revolution? Was it, you know, some of the the arcade games from the late 90s and early 2000s, which really sucked compared to their uh, video game counterparts from 20 years earlier? I'm sorry. Give me Pac-Man, Dig Dug, Frogger, all those games all day. I don't want to play any of the the kiddie crap that they played uh, uh, from the, the early 2000s. Okay, they had Dance Dance Revolution, but they did have a joust machine. Oh! Oh my god, they have a joust machine? Okay, yeah. I'm there for joust. Dance I'm Dance Revolution. For, I'm, I'm, I'm there for Dance okay. Dance Revolution. Okay, they, they got Hydro Thunder. That I'm there for a, Hydro Thunder. Hydro Thunder was a And they got an air hockey table. I'm there for the... Uh, 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 yeah, I'm there for the air hockey, and I'll be yeah. there for joust. Okay, Hunter was the gold star winner in this episode because his hard work was finally recognized by the council. I don't think we've heard Hunter's name before now. So that sort of shows how, for lack of a better word, neglected he was? Yeah. Yeah. Well, good on Hunter. Well, no exits. The broadcast did not show anyone talking about leaving. And for the first time, the broadcast did not show Jonathan asking if anyone wanted to leave. And also they put on Wikipedia for some reason. It is also Michael's 15th birthday. Yay. Yay. Cool. 
A new leader was added to the town after the kids neglected their duties. The council appointed Sophia to help enforce the rules, as we mentioned, giving her the title of town sheriff. Many of the kids were really upset at possibly having an unelected leader. Sophia, however, was honored at her new responsibility as sheriff. Like I said, she's the one smart person on this show. Or or at least the one responsible person. Yeah. One person you could trust. Yeah. Episode 12, Where's Bonanza, Dude? The town council goes on an expedition beyond Bonanza City and meets with Native Americans whose wisdom changed how the council approached giving the gold star. Sheriff Sophia is left in charge of Bonanza City while the council was away to make sure everyone gets their jobs done before being allowed inside the arcade. With only a few days left, everyone realizes it's not going to be easy saying goodbye to their Bonanza City family. And they make a vow to make the most of the rest of their time here. Okay, in this showdown, without the town council, the town had to run a race to build homesteads. With a nod to the Homestead Act, each district had a house, an alpaca, chickens, and a flag to move from one end of a field to the other in 60 minutes. The first team to finish moving their homestead became the upper class. Each district completed their homestead with the yellow district finishing in the nick of time. The reward was a choice between a monument dedicated to Kid Nation or a ride in a hot air balloon to allow the kids an aerial view of the, of the product of their efforts over the past 36 days. Sophia had been appointed by the council to choose the reward and decided upon the hot air balloon rides. Now, guys, a monument, okay? If I were in the town of Kid Nation, I would say... You know, guys, you know what I think we should build? A monument to McLean Stevenson. You damn right I would suggest they build a monument to McLean Stevenson. And they'd say, who's McLean Stevenson? I was like, dude, you don't you, know who McLean Stevenson is? You don't know who McLean Stevenson is, kids? Get out of this town. Get out, I don't want to know you. Get the hell out of here. Oh, no. I was afraid Greg was going to say it. I'm glad I did, though. Oh, no. (laughs) What do you mean you kids don't remember Hello, Larry? We weren't born then! (laughs) Oh, for heaven's sake. Oh, boy. Oh, you almost lost me there. Oh, my gosh. Again... Proving Sophia is the rational of the group. Plus also, what necessarily does a monument dedicated to Kid Nation really bring to the festivities? I, I really think the, the, the balloon ride was the, the obvious choice here because y- you get to see what you've created, especially over the last you know, 36 or so days, yeah. as they mentioned. You get, mm-hmm. see, you get to see everything on Friday in a hot air balloon. And who, who, it's a hot air balloon. Come on. But I would have loved to see the monument dedicated to McLean Stevenson, who had nothing to do with Kid Nation. <laughs> Alex was the gold star winner in episode 12, as Alex's hard work and intelligence were the determining factors in winning the award. No exits, and regarding the arcade, all oh, sad news. The town council shut down the video arcade permanently because of its service as a distraction from work, communication, and interaction with the other pioneers during their last days in Bonanza, though with some protests from other pioneers. Yep. Gotta give kids their DDR. Yeah. Okay, the final episode. We've all decided to go mad. The kids wake up to see the job board burnt down and destroyed. The town then gathered around the job board with Jonathan, who burned the journal after Mallory suggested it, and the pioneers unanimously agreed. After that, many of the kids go chaotic, ignoring the protests from the other kids. After raiding the town's dry goods store, the pioneers come together as a group and clean up their mistakes. After the showdown, they are finally reunited with their parents and share a town party with them. After the giving of three fifty thousand dollars dollar gold stars, the pioneers say their goodbyes and leave the town they built forever. Oh, I wonder, is this still 
existing? Is this extant? This this uh, town, as it were. Yeah. It's a it's a it's a filming ranch. It has to exist, right? Well, I mean, it, I'm talking about what the the kids did in Kid Nation. All these upgrades and the the changes that they all saw uh, when they went in the balloon ride. It wasn't one of those things where after uh, filming was uh, done, uh, it was essentially let's say struck for lack again lack of a better word, uh, and then sort of returned to its former glory, kind of sort of. Yeah, I'm I'm guessing that's what happened. Yeah, yeah uh, though I'd love to see if the arcade is still there. I'd love to get to that 13 year old or it hasn't been touched in 13-year-old Joust game, which is actually like 40 years old at this point. Fun fact, you know what was filmed there in 2014? Seth MacFarlane's A Million Ways to Die in the West. Wow, okay. Yeah. So, so yeah, um, that is an actual functioning hot set, I believe the uh, kids call it. And we know that Seth MacFarlane is playing Joust. Not oh, even, no, no, not he's even playing Hydro back. Thunder. Get it right. No, oh, he play, he's a kid of the 80s. He played Joust. Although I would love to see Sepik for him playing Hydro Thunder. That would be, that'd be a cool image to see. Oh, oh, I got an even better idea. Seth McFarlane as Ryan Lochte playing Hydro Thunder. Oh, boy. How many swims would you give it, Mike? Hey, look, there's one final showdown. Oh, there was one final showdown for Bonanza City, but without individual districts. As the town competed as a whole and had three tasks to complete. Make dinner, which was pasta, build picnic tables, and take out the trash, and subsequently bury it. That same task occurred in Episode 6. The first task was made easier by the town council's decision in Episode 3 to take the microwave. Okay, so they did make the smart decision to take the microwave. That's great. They had one hour to complete the three tasks. The reward for this showdown was three additional gold stars worth $50,000 each. Now, Zach was the final $20,000 gold star winner. When faced with an impromptu decision, the town council recognized Zach's hard work and his attitude toward making Bonanza a better place. Now, the town earned three big gold stars as a reward this week, with each being worth $50,000. The winners were Sophia, who was considered by the town council to be the most consistent hard worker in the town, as well as the most consistent in attitude towards the community. The council noted this was the easiest decision for them, as Sophia had been a constant hard worker and source of encouragement for the other kids. She had also won a $20,000 gold star in the first episode. Morgan was selected by the council for her attitude and helpfulness in uniting the community. Morgan had consistently played the role of a calming presence and seemed to be the big sister for the entire town. She had also won a $20,000 gold star in the fourth episode. And then, Miggle. The council, rec- I love how it says on Wikipedia. the council recognized Miggle, a minor character, as the most improved Bonanza citizen. And this is the first time, I don't know if it's Miggle or Miggle, this is the first time we're hearing of this kid. Miggle? I'm getting Michael. Just, Michael, I'm, Michael. Okay. Yeah. I, I just want to say this. Hashtag Jared was robbed. <laughs> Jared didn't get anything in this. Jared, I don't Jared think. did not get anything. They should have. This is the new. This is the new hashtag. Gary was robbed. Jared was robbed. Uh, also, his name. It looks like his Miglay. And oh hey. my gosh! Well, he, he, uh, he came from Lithuania. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Okay. His name is Migle. Migle. Got it. She. It's a she, not a he. She. Oh, okay. Uh, oh, Migle. There you go. Yeah, M- Migle. She is actually an inspiring actress, and says is represented by Charlie's Talent Agency. Oh, okay. That's good. So apologies to Miggle, Michael, Miggle. Oh, oh gosh. Yeah. Well, well, guys. As I say, this is the first time I'm seeing your name. If I screw it up, I humbly apologize, but I'll get it right the second time. Yeah. Well, guys, Kid Nation was one of the most controversial shows 
of the 2007 fall season. Bordering on exploitative. Yeah. They didn't e- CBS didn't even bother to screen this for critics. Nope. That's that's like that's like one of the uh, red flags that like you know your show is crap. Don't even bother to screen it for the critics because you know your show is crap. Now Tom Shales of the Washington Post reviewing the first episode suggested the show is not so much an exercise in socialization as the indoctrination of children into a consumer culture. Shales pointed out that the kids' decisions included buying root beer at the saloon with quote-unquote real money, but not hiring or being hired as their money was parceled out to them according to their predetermined situations in life. And by the third episode, some advertisers that had shied away from Kid Nation due to its initial controversy had begun to purchase time. Money talks. Damn right, money talks. And it's like money talks and BS walks and it walked right into Kid Nation and yeah. Like I said, we'll form this new community, but we won't do it for free. No. And actually, Time Magazine named Kid Nation one of the top ten new series of 2007. Do you know what it ranked as? What did it rank as? Tenth. Yeah. Uh, Which is funny, considering there are only nine new shows in 2007. It's like we had we have to pick a we have to pick a tenth show. Oh, geez. All right, so let's, let's put Kid Nation in there. Whatever. Yeah, we can't we can't pick the rich list. No, that's gone after one episode. Future installment, by the way. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. But Kid Nation, guys, it, it was one season. It was one and done. But guys, recently, this show has come back into our collective conscience. This. And why is that? Because Funny or Die has done an ongoing web series about Kid Nation. Yep. And I'll tell you right now, it is a really good watch. It is. It's uh, if you're if you're a fan of Funny or Die's uh, regular stuff, this is something you should waste your time on because, again, it, it offers like really in depth analysis. And the thing of it is, it's not that in depth. I mean, the show itself is not in depth. The show itself just happens. Do you expect these kids to have some sort of nuance or uh, some sort of ulterior motive to their actions? No. They're just there to survive until the end of it. They're just kids. Now, one story that I'm reading about, uh, apparently on the set, a child drank bleach. Wait, what? What? I'll say that again. A child drank bleach. Angie explained that uh, this had been the result of a bottle of bleach being mistaken for a bottle of seltzer water that they had for flavoring drinks in the town store. But medical staff uh, that were there uh, immediately treated uh, the affected child who returned to the set shortly afterward. So they had a bottle of bleach there instead of seltzer water and they were making flavored drinks in that uh, in the, the dry goods store or the, the general store, yikes! That's all I'm gonna say is yikes. That yep. that's that's scary. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It almost sounds like this was sort of doomed from the start. Well, you want to? Well, <laughs> well, well I mean, we're getting I'll, ahead of ourselves, aren't we? Well, well no, I, I I I agree with that, but just from the the Lord of the Flies sort of like backstory. Do we not remember what happened in Lord of the Flies after everything was said and done? Uh, yeah. They Spoiler, it down. didn't end well. Yeah. Um, the island, if I'm not mistaken, caught fire. Which is totally not the fault of the kids, except it was. Exactly, because, uh, and also, let's remember, you know, I don't want to get into a big literature lesson from 30 years ago but let's remember piggy's glasses were what created fire when uh it uh, got the sunlight and somebody broke piggy's glasses so you know what oh you've got no more fire yep 
So, so there goes your civilization. And it, it, like I said, it sounds like this was doomed from the start. And we're not even talking about like the last episode where apparently anarchy was a new word in the kids' uh, lexicons. So what did we learn on this show? Keep society to the grown-ups. Oh, God. That's even, that's even worse. Yeah. You know what? I don't care. Let the kids run the town. I don't care. It's like, let the kids run the town. Hey, we, we, they can make conscience decisions, and hell, they can put an arcade in. I don't care. Yeah, just let them give, give you a Hydro Thunder arcade. Yeah, that's cool. Let them play Joust till their hands fall off. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, what can we say except Kid Nation, Kid Power, Kid Rule, Kid Ambition, actually an adult-sized ambition, but in the end, it was just a thing on TV. And unlimited uh, drinks laced with bleach. Oh, boy. Yeah, that's... mm. Well, somebody screwed up big time there. I didn't even know they had bleach back in uh, Bonanza City. Wow! Okay, next up, we have one person that's been practicing this all night. Give it up for my man, Jared. Okay, now get up. (laughs) Okay, I'm doing a monologue from Shakespeare's King Henry V. What's to say? A very little, little must be do, and all is done. Le- then let the trumpet sound and the tucket sonnets, and though we upon this mountain's bases by took stand for, I, uh, for idle watch. But behold, yon poor and starved band, and your fair show shall suck away their souls, leaving them but the shales and husks of men. Yeah! I wasn't the worst. Oh, Jared. Jared. He was uh he was the undisputed king of Kid Nation. Uh he was a, he was an absolute joy every time he was on screen. Uh it was great. I mean, Kid Nation, it was it was something else. I'll tell you. It was something else. Alright, so in place to be nation pop right now, we have had a couple of shows come down the pipe in the last week um, Pop Goes the Classic series on Star Trek films Scott and Tech recently did Star Trek 3 The Search for Spock from 1984 as they answer the question so did he die or didn't he that and many other questions are answered on Pop Goes the Classics as the boys grade their categories and talk Leonard Nimoy as a director the music and is Doc Brown a Klingon great Scott and in episode 35 of Laugh-In Theater, covering I Love You, Man, Andy Afferton was joined by returning guest Jason Sherman to do a live watch of the film as they discuss social anxiety, fist bumps, office pranks, fencing, mandates, broken lizard, open houses, crop dusting, awkward voicemails, Andre the Giant rocking a scarf, first dates, bad accents, slapping the bass, rush fan seating charts, and the guy code. And in the latest episode of Diamond Conversations, the show welcomed former New York Mets pitcher Glendon Rush, who was a key member of Bobby Valentine's 2000 World Series team. Rush became a reliable arm who flourished on the biggest stage in New York Subway Series, but Rush also had a great career with the Royals, Brewers, and Rockies with an incredible journey through the Kansas City minor league system that he dives deep into this fun walk down memory lane. Also, be sure to check out the PTBN Wrestling Network, which includes a dive into topics running the gamut from the day's WWE through yesteryear, as the feed includes the Place to Be podcast, Mid Event, Jenny and the Gems, Body Pressure Luck, PTP NXT, the NWA Saturday Special, NWA Crock and Roll, Highway to the Impact Zone, and so much more. Subscribe today. And while you're at it, subscribe to Jennifer Smith's The Jenny Position feed as well. It is the home of Geek and Sassy, Talk and Pop, Freak Out Drive-In, The Journey Through Infinity, Telling Stories, The Brother Sister Rewatch Podcast. Bianca's first time and more. And check out the North South Connection, which is also the home for Wrestling Warzone, The Old's Bar, The Extreme Through a Dance, The Ruthlessly Aggressive Podcast, Carolina Dreaming, Jeff Lynn's Wrestling, and more. 
And of course, on the social media pages, the greatest song from a movie tournament is going on, and you can keep tabs on the tournament Facebook page for details. And we have the 2020 Stretch Project going on to determine the greatest WCW match ever. You have until December 31st to do research, promote matches, and build your list. The conversation rules can be found at www.facebook.com slash gwcwmatches or on the Pro Wrestling Only Message Board. And be sure not to forget to check out placebnation.com each and every day. We have new voices, fresh takes, bring you articles on topics in the worlds of wrestling, sports, and pop culture, including Trent Smackdown on Fox Report, This Week in the WWE by John Crow, Steve Riddle's Wonderful World of Disney Reviews, Paulie's Perspective, Matt's live-action Disney movie reviews, and Ben's unpopular opinion. And if you're doing online shopping over at Amazon.com, be sure to click on the Amazon banner on the right side of the PTPN homepage or use www.placebnation.com slash Amazon. It'll take you right to Amazon and it'll help out PTBN at no cost to you. All right, so we did Kid Nation. We did a notorious reality show flop for CBS. But let's go into the biggest reality show flop of them all. As we go back to only a few years ago, back in 2014, as we cover a show from the creator of such great shows as Deal or No Deal and Big Brother and Demol, as we look at a show known as Utopia. So let's check it out. Episode 96, submission number 762, Utopia. Utopia aired on Fox from September 7th to October 31st of 2014 for a total of 12 episodes. Well, guys, last episode, we talked about a social experiment where kids ran a civilization, let's say. They they ran a city, uh, not necessarily a nation in Kid Nation, but... So they they sort of did like a Lord of the Flies type of, of thing. And we're going to talk about another series like that. And it, it seems just like over the last hmm, 20 years, maybe even less than that, 15 years, we talked about Kid Nation. We're going to talk about Utopia now. And also we cannot forget when Cartman tried creating his own society in the episode uh, The Simpsons Did It where he combined seamen, that one, yeah, with sea people to create a society. And that didn't end up well. No. Hey, just like Kid Nation, and guess what? Just like Utopia. Uh, yeah. This was, and stop me if you've heard this one, based on a Dutch format created by John DeMole. Okay, what hasn't been created by John DeMole? Seriously, where should we start? Deal or no deal. Deal or no one, deal. One versus a hundred. One versus a hundred. Um, the voice. I, I love, the voice. Like every single. Big like, brother. Like every game show and reality TV format from like the last 15 to 20 years in some way is a uh, John DeMall creation. Divided. Yep. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'll so, give you that. I'll, I'll give you that. Yeah. So, so we can add... Uh, yeah, Divided's on the list, too. So, yeah, they've done many, many, many shows. Uh, John DeMall and, uh, and Talpa. Oh, Fear and, Factor. Do not forget Fear Factor. And this is definitely one of those shows. Yeah, one of those high-ambition, big-ticket items that uh, John DeMall really wanted to uh, see if it could work. I don't know if it worked in... I don't know if it worked in the Netherlands, but uh, let's just say Fox saw something on the show and decided rather than get into a costly bidding war for the rights to the American version, they point they ponied up. Are you ready for this? Uh, actually, let me wait till Mike finishes swallowing because he's going to spit out that whatever it is he just ate. No, I wasn't, but yeah, go ahead. Fox ponied up $50 million in order to avoid a costly and some would think protracted bidding war for the rights of this show. They must have really liked this. Well, here's the premise. 
It follows a cast of 15 men and women placed in isolation and filmed 24 hours a day for a planned year. Yeah, that doesn't sound like it's, or that doesn't sound familiar at all. The cast was create their own society and figure out how to survive. The series was initially shown twice a week, with online streaming 24-7 with 129 hidden and unhidden cameras all over the Utopia compound. So rather than the Wild West uh, backdrop of Kid Nation, the Utopians lived in a compound, and the live streams of said compound were populated and, and made active on August 29th, and over 5,000 people auditioned to be one of the 15. Now, why on earth would you want to do that, I wonder? Was money involved? Eh, probably. It doesn't say, but probably. Now, every month in Utopia, three pioneers were nominated for elimination, and the person who was eliminated would be sent back would be exiled back to their everyday lives. And the streamers would be able to decide which of the new pioneers got their cast to got their chance to join the cast. So yeah, it's Big Brother Paradise Hotel and Kid Nation all rolled into one. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> uh-huh. I know. Uh you spent fifty million dollars to get the format rights? sight unseen yeah so who were the uh, utopians chosen for this grand experiment let's find out uh we have dave and an unemployed new yorker jonathan a pastor from tennessee red a handyman from kentucky brie a veterinary assistant from california mike an attorney from Manhattan, Rob, a security programmer from New Jersey, Nikki, a holistic doctor from Brooklyn, Josh, a general contractor from Salt Lake City, Hex, an unemployed Detroiter, Dedeker, a belly dancer from Los Angeles, Chris, a chili farmer from North Carolina, Bella, a real estate entrepreneur from Georgia, Amanda, a behavioral specialist from Seattle, and Aaron, a chef from Oxford, Mississippi. Now that is, if I'm not mistaken, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, only fourteen. Now there was a sh- uh, f- the fifteenth was. Andrea, a chef from San Diego, who did not start, huh? Before the show even premiered, things got a little bit heated. We have uh, two pioneers seceding from the other, from the others, calling themselves the Utopia State of Freedom. And before filming began, one contestant was kicked off the show for smuggling in a cell phone to look up her castmates. So there you go. We have. Hooking up, getting naked, secession, fan favorites, and one person trying to uh, sneak in a cell phone when they weren't supposed to. And that was before the first episode. Boy, that doesn't sound like a good start. Oh, gosh. What can we say? Now, we said every month somebody was going to be uh, asked to leave and... Uh, new people would be cycled in. Well, it just so happens that the first time that happened was not even a month in. The first person to leave actually left two weeks into this thing when Dave left Utopia on his own accord and was replaced with Kristen, an entrepreneur from Jamestown, New York. Also, uh, Rhonda, a political activist, was also added. She would not last an entire week. She ended up leaving, being rejected, in September 9th. So, for five days. Five days in Utopia. 
And then we have another utopian added to the cast, Taylor, a construction worker from Omaha. No one else would be added again until September 21st when we have Ernesto, a contractor from Oceanside. Then we have, uh, on September 30th, actually on September 10th, uh, Jonathan was injured and medevaced out of Utopia. And on September 30th, Red was banished from Utopia. He was actually the first person to be banished from Utopia. And taking his place on September 30th was, this is really hard to map out here, Cal, a farmer from Portland, Oregon. And he would actually be the last person to enter Utopia. Wait, that's a lie. Katie, an animal rescuer from Sacramento, also entered Utopia, but she also wouldn't last a week. I, it's, hard to, it's hard to follow, isn't it? Yep. But okay, but okay. Now this is easier to follow because October twenty fifth, Bree left Utopia. October twenty sixth, Mike left, citing a family emergency. And October thirty first, Rob was the second person banished from Utopia. On the final episode. On the final episode. Well, technically, wasn't everybody banished after that episode? Yeah, that that is true. Yeah. So a bunch of people came, a bunch of people left. There wasn't really much of a storyline. All it was was Big Brother in the woods, basically. It's sort of off the grid, yeah. Off the off the grid, Big Brother. People got naked, and yeah. And the ratings for the series. They certainly didn't justify $50 million being spent. Oh, no. The, the premiere, and I remember watching the premiere, uh, I was intrigued by the whole concept uh, of them being in this banished society, if you will, this utopia for a year. 4.63 million people saw the premiere on September 7th. Mm-hmm. Two days later for part two, the number dropped almost by half, 2.48 million. Yeah, and, th- like and then Cap- it dro- and, and then for part three, which aired three days later, September twelfth, it dropped by again about another twenty percent, under two million viewers. Yeah, that's not a good sign. Uh, it did pick up for week two, but uh, after week two, uh, the ratings were under two million viewers for every single episode from uh, episode five on. That's not uh, money well spent, especially when you're talking about $50 million just to acquire the rights to the TV show. Well, what a waste of money. Yep. Hey, it's not my money. It's Rupert Murdoch's money. Yeah, Rupert, 50, yeah, $50 million for Rupert Murdoch is pretty much walking around money. Yeah, that's yeah. pocket change to him. Yeah, that's not even the amount of money he paid for my space. Well, one thing we should mention, there was a host. I, with like every reality show, there's there's a host, obviously. There, there's a there's a host. Who's the there's host? A, who is it? The host. Some people may be familiar with this name. I asked Greg and Chico about this before we started recording, and they both said, "Don't know who he is." No. And I said, "How could clip. you not know who this guy is? This guy is the creator of one of the funniest comic strips, in my opinion." Uh, I, I've loved it for probably, it's, it's been in this area for, I'm guessing, close to 20 years at this point, and they don't know who this guy is. His name is Dan Peraro, and Dan Peraro is the creator of the comic strip. It's a single panel comic strip, not unlike The Far Side, and it's called Bizarro. And like I said, it's been in, in this newspaper, in, in the, the local Cleveland newspaper, I'd guess for close to 20 years, if not even longer. And both of them have never heard of it. And I'm like, okay, th- this obviously isn't as big as maybe I thought it was. But yeah, so he's a comic strip creator, artist, and he's a host of a TV show. And I don't know how that intersects, how one goes from being a comic strip writer 
to a host of a reality show because as far as I know, he had never done anything like this. He's not known for being some sort of TV personality. And really, I don't know that much about him uh, in his you know, normal life that, that he'd uh, be involved in this. It's just very interesting, I believe. Yeah, um, again, it's like he's known for, you know, he's known primarily for being a cartoonist and a political uh, cartoonist who pretty much makes his whole uh, things known through his comic books. But aside from that, uh, uh, oh yeah, he's also an author. I forgot he also wrote books. He, he was a book writer. The Book of Lame Excuses in 1991 comes to mind. And also, he's had some books, uh, some art books. Not necessarily books uh, about uh, Bizarro or collections of Bizarro. But uh, I did, picked up one of these books maybe about 10 years ago for maybe like $2 at some, some cheap bookstore. It was just a, a bizarre, and again, I, I use that term very loosely because I know he did bizarro. Pun it was just a very bizarre much. book. A, a Pun bizarre, very much intended, isn't it? Uh, it? It wasn't really intended. It was just a bizarre art book. It wasn't comic strips. It was just art. And I'm glad I didn't pay more than like $2 for it because I don't think I've touched it since I first got the book. I was two, More than $2. That is like one, tw- one hundred, that's one in, that's God, one twenty-five millionth the price of this show. And, and uh, just like uh, Fox, it was money I regret spending. <laughs> so I guess the question, because you pretty much know what happened, or you pretty much know what happened on the show, but how did all? How did we get here? Because I have some uh, critic blurbs. See, Fox made Fox actually. They could, actually Fox couldn't screen the the uh, pilot because it was all live. But uh, okay, so Brian Lowry of Variety said, "If Utopia has any legs at all, it will as a cable style freak show, not some grand experiment in democracy. Indeed, the diverse lineup seems to." Des- designed to draw from various unscripted staples, a dash of doomsday preppers here, a dollop of Duck Dynasty there, and throw them together in the same blunder. Which actually just makes zero sense in, in or out of context. Meanwhile, Willa Paskin of Slate said, Utopia's attempts to condemn the misbehavior it desperately requires from its participants strives to frame its mission in a positive light, distancing itself from the on-camera misbehavior it, its producers so desperately require. Through the first two episodes, five of the eight men assembled a violent physical outburst. The female cast members avoid the trap of being portrayed as catty and vicious. As a result, they are granted no personalities at all, just a penchant for swimming naked. The first night ends with one case of alcohol poisoning, another of threatening sexual behavior, and two fights. Peraro sat Leo Pines that so far the group is bailing miserably at Utopia, as if the producer has been ho- hoping for a dull, conflict-free Eden. So, it, so more or less, everybody was not concentrating on making uh, some sort of grand experiment, but rather making what Fox thought was good television. And that, le- and that led to, I think, one of the most common, uh, most, one of the most common causes of a show like this failing, killed by the network. Because uh, according to an article from The Wrap, it was basically a, an overwrought case of network interference. So Fox had a reality head replace Mike Darnell, the uh, genius behind, uh, well, Fox's earlier re- reality show attempts. And like they said, $50 million to avoid a, a bidding war. They were looking for the next big thing after American Idol started to fall off and the X Factor, future entry, the X Factor, decided... 
that it wasn't everybody did not like nice Simon Cowell. So enter Simon Andrea, the uh, new alternative chief for Bucks, and constantly butting heads with John the Mall about where to go with this format. And, uh, and of course, the rap has this article that says, these two are at odds since David Hill, sporting event star David Hill, rightly pointed out in the company that Utopia may be a giant expensive embarrassment in the making. While Utopia debuted in the Netherlands as the highest rated unscripted premiere in six years and remains number one in its time period for 10 consecutive nights, the Dutch ratings did not hold up over the show's run. So the show started with 1.4 million viewers in the Netherlands and ended with 963 thousand so yeah fox was thinking you know what you don't have anything to worry about we're fox i mean we can make a show we can make a reality show we can we can put one with legs yeah we can write off one bad one well they well this they're known for taking a chance on crap yeah Yeah, i said that yeah, they do. You're right. Uh, and, and remember, si- and this is a guy who was behind Discovery Channel's Naked and Afraid. So he sends uh, Damol ideas. Damol tells his team to ignore them, and he hardly considers Andre to be his creative equal. So he was right, though. Everybody got naked in that first episode, but it didn't really uh, do much of the way of ratings. Nudity does not equal ratings. No, it does not. And another fault had to do with the casting because it was meant to bring people together so they could form a new society. But here's the thing. You can create a uh, society or... Okay, so Damal was in it to create society. Andre was in it to create television. So they ended up choosing people so extreme, some viewers called them stereotypical, versions of Americans that agreements were hard to come by. And this is from uh, executive producer John Kroll. The production team might have done too well with choosing differing points of view. In the first group of pioneers had, as they had a hard time seeing eye to eye on anything in their first week in seclusion. We went over this. We literally went over this. The next two cast members nominated to join the group showed some promise of creating more harmony. This is uh, Dana Walden, former Fox co-chairman and CEO, who said, No one thought we were going to launch a huge ratings juggernaut, but with patience, it will grow, and we're going to have patience. Well, we we, we were going to have patience. Everybody was going to have patience. Well, here's the thing. Fox is not known for having patience. This is a show that, if it if it's if this is a network that if it puts it if the sh- if the network puts something on Friday, it has every intent on killing it. Well, Fox put the show between Tuesdays and Friday. Then before then in October, they pulled it from Tuesday. Oh, that's not good. So that left the Friday airings. And that, this was just four weeks after the show premiered. So what is a network to do? How about this? We charge people unlimited access to the cameras for $5 a month. Oh, $5 a month. That's, gonna, that's really going to bring them in. It's really going to bring the marks in. Mm-hmm. Got to make money somehow. They got to recoup that fifty million one way or another. You got to make that scratch back. Yeah, yeah. Um, they. I, I don't think they ever came close to recouping their loss until I want to say either Empire or The Masked Singer started. Oh, probably, absolutely. Uh, I, I would probably even lean towards the the latter. I say The Masked Singer, as big as that's become over the last two years. Uh, even going as far as having a tour, which unfortunately got canceled because of this whole COVID thing. Oh, 
Well, but, but I'm just being I, honest. They, they were going to tour. And actually, I was thinking about going to their stop here because I, I like the Mass Singer. I'm not a big fan, but I enjoy the, the, the whole concept. And uh, I believe the show was supposed to be here during June, which unfortunately it coincided with what would have been a, an international trip for me. So I couldn't go anyhow. But again, that was all null and void because of COVID. I got a question. Yeah. Do, do you think at the tour we would have had T Pain singing in the monster costume? Well, they promised there'd be celebrities there. Uh, now, from what I read, celebrity I think was emphasized in terms of being local celebrities. So oh. maybe you would have seen maybe athletes, or maybe you would have seen you know local TV personalities or radio personalities, oh, or chefs. I- Oh, I would have loved to have seen Kevin Love sing in a costume. That would have been awesome. Well, okay. Well, that would have that would have been June, and yeah, the Cavs would have never made the playoffs. So, it's possible. You never know. But uh, they they were touting local celebrities. It wasn't like they had the usual cast of characters. Oh, hey, look, it's you know uh, Alonzo Bowden or uh, uh, Jim J. Bullock or somebody like that. It's Somebody oh. who's, who's prime passed them up like 15, oh, 20 years ago. Oh, dude, if Jim J. Bullock was singing in a costume, you know I'd be all over that shit. Oh, I know you'd be. I know you'd oh, be. Oh, I would be so happy. But, yeah, it looks like they uh, promoted local celebrities more than uh, celebrities in that, like, C slash D tier that uh, are just making the rounds for a paycheck. Mm-hmm. But again, we'll never know what happened. And I, I and they did have a, a name host, not unlike what they uh, do with uh, the Price is Right Live, where they have Jerry Springer and they have uh, Todd Newton and a certain uh, group of hosts that go around the country. They did have, I don't remember the name because obviously it's been canceled now. You know, it was canceled back in March and. Uh, I sort of didn't pay attention to it when I saw it was going to coincide with my trip, but uh, they did have like a name MC. So not necessarily a Jerry Springer type, but somebody in that same realm where you've heard of him and yeah, he he may not have regular work necessarily at this time. Now, uh, ultimately now the, now the, now the article I just gave you guys also said that Simon's departure was imminent. Well, on March 2015, Simon Andreetti did leave Fox's alternative entertainment department. It's kind of funny you mention that because I have a page pulled up and it says that Simon returned to London in 2015. Gosh, I wonder why. Hmm. Why is that? Uh, because he got let go by Fox. I know. That's the joke. I, yeah, I get it. I get it. But don't feel too bad for Simon because right now he's the CEO of Fremantle UK. Yeah. Yep. He's probably sitting on top of those cans of uh, reruns of uh, Bruce's Price is Right. Yeah, and Family Fortunes and all those shows. Yeah. He's he's actually get, he's actually getting ready to bring blankety blank blankety blank blankety blank blankety blank. Oh yeah, blankety blanks. The UK match came back, and you know yep. who, you know who's rumored to be a host of that. Uh, I know, I know this, I know this. I know you know this. Trudeau. I know this. Say Does it. Mike know this? Does Mike know this? Mike heard it, but it it doesn't ring a bell. Ryan Stepdaddy, the master of the chasers. Bradley Walsh, baby! Oh, yeah, I did read that. Oh, my gosh. The only way I think that could be more amazing is if they got Ryland to host. I'm sorry, I love Ryland on Supermarket Sweep. Oh, yeah. We can get Gary the security guard on the panel. (laughs) I knew he was going to say that. that You could have Gary the security guard and Jody Whitaker on the same panel. Mind blown. Oh my gosh. Think about that. You'd have the doctor and Gary the security guard on the same panel. How great would that be? Listen uh, to me, Fremantle. You're sitting on a potential gold mine idea. Steal my idea. You will make you will have ratings 
through the wazoo. You have Gary, the security guy with Rylan hosting, or even Rylan as a panelist and Bradley Walsh hosting. I, I think Greg is going to explode. I, I seriously think we're going to lose Greg. He's going to just like implode from all the excitement and joy. Oh. But enough about what's coming down the road with uh, Fremantle UK. Fox didn't come even close to recouping their losses for for Utopia. And I'm wondering if the Dutch ever did as well. Because, if I'm not mistaken, this came out after The Voice, right? Yes. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. So they were basically paying for this with voice money. Which and, and back when it started, The Voice was a license to print money. I would... I don't necessarily think there would be any money necessarily lost and by that what i mean is it's very possible john demal might have aired this uh series on his network talpa uh-huh because that's where a lot of his shows aired that's where again deal or no deal aired one versus a hundred the original version ain't taken hundred aired uh a, a lot of his games and reality show, shows aired on the talpa network so i wouldn't be surprised if he kept it in-house and also thus you know minimizing the cost or at least he's taking all the risk not necessarily a a network another network is taking the risk oh yeah i mean he's no idiot he, he's a media genius regardless of how you feel about his formats uh whether again we're talking about deal or no deal uh specifically the u.s version because the u.s version does not compare to any other version the the uk and the dutch versions are absolutely amazing and uh and obviously he's done big brother again love it or hate it It, it's a franchise around the world uh versus 100 is still big uh even still in uh in uh, the netherlands where now because of covid it's now one versus 50 really social distancing yeah it's, it's one versus 50 now so they've they've uh, tinkered with the, the game a little bit and obviously you can't have 100 people sitting so close to each other so now it's it's 50 people okay so i, I don't really think uh even if uh, the dutch version didn't do that well i'm sure john demal will write it off or it's again uh sort of like rupert murdoch it's like pocket change it, it's like he dropped a dollar when he was uh, in the supermarket, except that dollar's like several million dollars because he's rich. Yeah. Well, the format hasn't resurfaced anywhere, but you want to know what did resurface just now? What? Some guy wanted to sell a poster of it. Oh, Mike, no. Oh. The music, please. Oh, crap. Yes, it's eBay Price is Right time. I have here a poster of the Utopia, a, a pub poster of Utopia, The caption, no leaders, no rules, no plumbing. Witness the birth of a brave new world. I'll tell you this. They didn't have an arcade at Utopia, unlike Kid Nation. They did not have an arcade on on Utopia. No, they're all too busy being naked and fighting. And, uh, And doing other things. While naked and fighting. While naked, yeah. <laughs> if you do that while you're naked and fighting, then you are a sadist. Anyway, Mike, why don't you uh, bid first? It doesn't say anything specific about the poster's size. Is it like 16 by 20? Or... It, it does not. Okay. Uh, and, and I'm guessing it's... Oh, wait. Oh, let me take... Yeah, let me take a look here. My mistake. This will this will get okay. This is this is okay. Here's the description: Fans of the television show Utopia, hosted by John Demol Jr., 
Yeah, that didn't happen. We'll love and appreciate this. This is a promotional poster distributed by the Fox Network to one of their affiliates, and they are not sold in stores. Poster measures 27 inches by 40 inches. Ooh, that's big. That That's something you definitely want to get framed. Okay. I don't know. I, I For some reason, I see it being expensive because it's a flop, and there's probably not a whole heck of a lot out there, but also at the same time, uh, supply versus demand. Um, I'll go, is it dollars and cents? Uh, I'll make it dollars. Okay, round dollars. Okay. I'll go, I'll say $15. Okay, you say 15 What do you say, Me? Greg? I'll go $19. Okay, so the actual buy it now price for this Utopia poster is... Oh we thirty eight dollars. Yes. Ooh, Greg. Greg had half of it. If he just doubled it, he would have been on the nose. Have we ever had a perfect bid in this segment? N- no. No, we have we, not. We, we, we've been very close, but we've we been, haven't had a perfect. We've bid. been really close. Well, Utopia started out with the best of intentions. Let's try and create a new society from scratch. But when you combine network meddling with poor casting and bad ratings, you know what you get? I know what you get. You get a thing on TV. You get a thing on TV. And and not a particularly good one, or at least memorable one in a good way. No. Well, as always, uh, don't forget uh, our website. Oh, hey, we have over 100 entries up there now, so you've got... Plenty of stuff to listen to. So if you're going on that late summer road trip or early fall road trip, if you're making those commutes back to work nowadays, since some offices are reopening, not a whole lot, not not schools, I can tell you that because I'm working from home. But yeah, if you're uh, commuting to your job or even if your commute's all of like 30 feet like my uh, commute is nowadays, feel free to listen to us. You know, we're a good time killer on the road. And we've heard from people who've done that. They've downloaded a number of our episodes for a lengthy road trip, and, and we've occupied their, their time. Yes. It's a lot better than just, like, you know, passively looking at farms in the middle of Indiana or, uh, you know, doing anything else uh, with your time. Miles will listen to us. And yeah. uh, you can find all those episodes at uh, www.itwasathingontv.com. Besides the episodes, we have all our socials at It Was A Thing on TV, on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, on Tumblr, and we have the Discord. And uh, as always, please don't forget, well, first off, sharing is caring. We got to say that first because we love sharing and we love caring. And uh, don't forget to like and subscribe. Wait, you said you like caring? I like Karen. caring. Oh, I thought you were talking about Karen Gillan. Uh, well, that, that can be taken another way nowadays, call, calling somebody a Karen. No, I don't uh, like Karens. No, no, no. Karen Gillan's the only Karen that should be ever referred to in a positive manner. I would agree with that. So uh, don't forget uh, beyond uh, the Karen, because Karen is Sharon, or caring is sharing. Uh, don't forget to rate and review, and don't forget to like and subscribe. And, and hey, remember, five stars, we will accept nothing less. That's Chica who said that. I'm willing to negotiate, but I'm uh, not as uh, stubborn as he is. Until next week. Oh, well, episodes 97 98, we're getting close to 100. <clears throat> two we weeks. Are. Two weeks until uh, episode 100. And I guarantee that's going to be an absolutely amazing show. We're going to have so much to talk about. And we got new stuff that's going to be coming down the pipe at that time. I was actually thinking about releasing some of the new stuff with the 10,000th download, which happened on uh, Thursday the 17th. But I'm going to hold off. I'm going to hold off to episode 100. And then I'll present what I, uh, what I want to uh, reveal uh, that day that I've been touting for the last, like, five weeks or so six weeks so i'm curious as to what this is are you gonna you're gonna have your like very own like 
like horse that you're going to ride in on. And I just might. Who's going to stop me? Uh, probably the person that owns a horse because I'll probably break its back. Uh, but yeah, so, yeah. so we're two weeks away from 100, but next week, 97 and 98, uh, we're going to talk about um, one of the biggest uh, disasters, and it isn't even necessarily a TV show more than a memorable or not so memorable season of a TV show. But also, we're going to dedicate an episode to to the local television scene. We, we want to talk about some local television. We've gathered some information about lo- local TV, which we think is going to make an entertaining episode of the podcast. So next week should be very interesting in some ways, kind of, sort of. But uh, it's definitely good. The second episode is going to be a little on the bizarre side. Uh, talking about the local TV stuff. There's going to be a lot of stuff to talk about. I know Greg has one or two subtopics he's ready to talk about, uh, and I think Chico's the same, and I've got one or two. So that, that should be a very, um, a very entertaining episode, to say the least. And definitely something you're going to want to scope out online. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. This is one where we may point you in the right direction, but you've got to go see... Uh, what uh, we've discovered or found on on YouTube and uh, throughout the internet. It'll definitely be a good episode. So that's next week. Until then, as always, thank you very much for listening. Uh, We appreciate the the patronage and uh, we'll be here starting on next Monday, the 28th with two new episodes of it was a thing on TV. Thanks for listening. Have a good week. Utopia.